Aloha Awina La, this is Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, Fridays at 3 p.m., keeping it on the bright side and off the grid. This afternoon is part two of my talk with community act activist, social justice organizer, and Hawaiian scholar Andre Perez about the movement at Standing Rock to protect water and indigenous rights and values. We're going to go a little deeper into some of the strategies that have been so effective. Mahalo, Randre, for returning. Mahalo for having me. Aloha. So um, we are, um, our backdrop today is one of the pictures you took of the, um, the yurts covered in snow with these beautiful, um, beautiful red painted elaborate doors. Mm. And um, so we're, we're in Honolulu. We're not, we're not there. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you were there. Yeah. Um, and um, let's, let's um, talk about um, kind of the, what, just briefly, you know, what, what the energy of it was. Well, the energy, the energy of that place is, um, was profound, powerful. Um, it makes me think about Hawaiian concepts and understandings of sacredness and, and mana as I've learned it from my teachers. And um, there's, this, there's this deeper understanding that we might say it's not the hail that makes the place sacred, it's the place that makes the hail sacred. Uh -huh. So, you know, feeling that, that mana. And, and in, in, in this context at Standing Rock, you know, you're surrounded by the, the lake and the river, and there's these hills that have burials on them, these little hills ringing one side. There's, there's this larger pu'u or hill turtle mountain or turtle hill that um, is bordering the, you know, the, the camp. So the camp is surrounded by this real positive, I think, mana, you know, with the water, the river flowing on one side, the hills and turtle hill on the other side. Um, and I think that's what creates the, you know, part of that um, energy and mana that, that we feel and the need to protect it. Um, so yeah, so, and then of course everyone coming there for the common cause, you know, sort of um, creates that synergy too. Um, and, you know, keeping, amplifying. Keeping it focused. I mean, I, I mm. think you said that there were like 7,000 people there one weekend. That's a lot. Yeah, I think there's actually more than that. I, when I got there, it was, you know, so-called Thanksgiving Day weekend. And a lot of people had come because of the three-day weekend. So that, when I got there, they were estimating about 4,000, which was huge. But when the vets came the following weekend, they, there's estimates that it was well over 10,000 people. Wow. So. And the logistics of caring for that many people and just keeping it cool under those, well, <laughs> keeping it cool on those winter <clears throat> conditions wasn't hard, but um, to, the, to have it stay meaningful and stay focused on the, what kinds of activities uh, were there to keep people um, really on, on point? I think one of the critical things was that early on, um, um, some community organizers um, and, and activist trainers like the Indigenous People's Power Project, who I was working with, um, and the tribe, the tribal elders, the council, the tribal council had um, collectively worked on these principles. Um, and the principles were posted up in different areas on large, like, plywood signs. Ah. And it talked about, it, it was a, they served as these grounding principles that served to remind people what you were, why you were here and what the objective was. And of course, and it was real simple, nothing complex. Yeah. We're here for water, to protect water. Um, yeah. And they were here um, in prayer and ceremony. Um, on, the, on the screen now are, um, these are the lessons that I learned from Standing Rock. So I, you know, I can kind of go through them, but to answer that question, the first one was um, having orientation on their cultural values and the things that were important and the focus, having nonviolent direct action training for everyone who comes into camp. And you were doing that. You were I was doing one that. of the trainers, yeah, for nonviolent direct action training. And uh, the number two, you know, one of the lessons that I see was they had clear principles about, um, uh, again, you know, uh, guiding principles. What they were there for, what they were focused on, protecting water. The approach was prayerful and ceremony, um, grounded in, you know, in their spirituality and uh, cultural values. 
Um, and, you know, um, other things that I saw that, that helped create that energy and focus was art. The art, the, the messaging. And it's important, you know, we understand how narrative affects um, via media and via perceptions, how, nar how narrative can, can affect our behavior and, and our cognitive understandings. Um, it's important to know that we need to have our own narrative. And we need to put out our own media and pictures and things that are important to us. So a lot of that was done via art. And we have some pictures of the, um, the art tent that we'll get to. Oh, there, we, there they are. So it, they're beautiful, beautiful. Um, right. <clears throat> so what we see here is art that was done um, all over, all over um, the continent. As different activists came in from different states, from as far as Washington and Alaska um, to Chicago to Denver, etc., cetera, um, people would bring their art and, and their silk screens and drop them off at the art tent. And so you had a, uh, um, a group of artists who were cycling through the art tent, and they were just putting out um, art in the form of silk screening for people's shirts, for these back patches that they would pin on to... Um, banners and signage that were used on the front line in direct action, knowing that there's a lot of media coverage, um, understanding that, you know, that there's, well, there's a lot of media coverage, not all of it's mainstream, but knowing that the, the importance of getting your narrative out on your terms, using your language is important. So... So they came ready-made with the art, and then... Some of it. Yeah. Yep, some of the screens, silk screens, for example. But a lot of the art was done right there in the art tent. You know, there was a lot of supplies, banners, etc. Here we have a, a, another picture um, of volunteers that just popped in one day. Um, this is uh, the kitchen in my camp, Indigenous People's Power Project. And these two um, girls showed up in aprons and started washing dishes cleaning up, and they ended the day by making dinner for us, and then they were gone. And I was like, who are these people, you know? So the next day, they came back and did the same thing. So I asked them, you know, who are you guys? What are you doing here? And they said, oh, we just came to help. And, um, you know, we, we, we want to help keep the kitchen clean and uh, cook a meal for you guys. You know, it's our contribution. Unbelievable. And there were really students beautiful. who were just there for the weekend. And so they came in for two days, cleaned up, did dishes for us, cooked a meal, and then they left, and they said, we got to get back home. Um, we have finals. Oh. So, yeah. you know, and th those little things, kuleana, seeing where you can plug in and pick up and help to carry the load, I think, was what, a, a, what was crucial to the entire Ocheti Shako in camp at Standing Rock. People just coming in and seeing where they could fit in and how they could help. Um, you know, a lot of initiative. And that takes, um, that takes, uh, uh, the a very, very um, grounded um, purpose. Grounded purpose, um, focus, and, you know, um, a lot of humility, you know. What the are ego you? thing. Yeah. Keeping the egos in check. Right. To hap did a good job. How did that happen? I mean, it w I mean, that's, I mean to be clear um, and fair and honest, Standing Rock wasn't without its egos. There's lots of egos going on. There's lots of power struggle and lots of dynamics going on, but the, but the majority of people, I would say, the large majority, were average people like you and me who just showed up to help and went there and, you know, with a sincere desire to somehow make a contribution. <clears throat> and um, the training and the principles helped them navigate where they could plug in. Yeah. So were, were people assigned roles in any way, or was it... Mm Maybe early on, you know, on the upper leadership levels, I would say, yes, you know, there was security. There were representatives from the different tribes. Um, there was elders and tribal council people and different, you know, in that context, the upper echelons of leadership. Sure. But the vast majority of people, people were just showing up every day at all hours of the day. They might roll in at 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. Wow. and just set up camp and, and try to figure out where they could plug in. But um, I think what was fundamental to that, I have, I'll always go back to 
the camp orientation that was required and promoted every day. If you're new to camp, you need to go to the orientation at 9 a.m. at the Dome. If you're new to camp, you need to go to the 2 p.m. nonviolent direct action training. So having that as a paramount um, um, expectation, I think, was what basically kind of funneled everyone through a process that gave them clarity um, and purpose to their being there. So um, th things, basic things like like energy. I saw there were some um, trucks set up that had had uh, solar panels, but right. then you were in snow, so <laughs> maybe not so, so much you, sunshine. So yeah, and well, it was decentralized a lot. Um, there were a lot of tribes, for example, the Oglalas or the Cheyenne River people or the Apache or whatever, Navajos, would come in and set up their own camp. Ah. And they would set up their own kitchen. And so they would, you know, sort of congregate around their sort of tribal affinities. But um, what I saw was you might, for example, the Ogallalas had their own camp and own kitchen. But they would feed anyone, anyone who would come in and, and, and need food, you know. Or, or the, um, you know, tribes from California would come in and set up a camp. And they would, you know, there was this sort of openness. Everyone was welcome. They might have their sort of cultural or tribal affinities, but there was also this, this open door kind of welcoming aloha spirit in a sense, you know. You know, their version of aloha spirit. Nobody was turned away. If you needed coffee or hot tea or just to get out of the snow and to warm up in a tent, you could virtually, you know, walk into any camp and, and be welcomed. So that, I think that fundamental sense of humanity was um, paramount and permeated the entire camp. That came through in the, in the pictures of, of the families and just even small babies. There was a baby born there even. There, right? was, there was babies born there. There was a midwifery, midwifery tent, I guess, set up to help women who were um, hapai, who were pregnant. And yeah, I think there was um, uh, some women who, as I left who were expecting to give birth there. Um, so you really had a, a, another, it's kind of bringing me to another, you know, value that we can relate to. You really had the sense of ohana, you know, and um, uh, ohana, you know, kinship and um, understanding that we're all in a way connected and bound by our love for the land, for the water, ultimately for, for the, Mother Earth to the protect, earth. yeah, protecting the resources, you know. So these common values really kept people cohesive, you know. Andre, we're going to take a break for a minute and come back and talk about how you are infusing our land here with some of, with some of this knowledge. Okay. Aloha, I'm Carl Campagna, host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I hope you join us over the next several weeks as we take a deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii and explore the alternative fuels supply chain necessary for the local and global transition towards transportation fuel sustainability. Join us as we have good conversations with our farmers, our producers, our conversion technologies, our investors, and our legislators as we try to achieve our transportation sustainability goals. See you soon. Hi, I'm Marianne Sasaki from Life in the Law. I'm so excited to be marching on Washington on Saturday, January 21st, with a, a big women's march on Washington. And here with me is Michael, who's heading up the local march uh, for women on Oahu. Come on out and visit us. We're going to be at the Capitol on January 21st, starting at 8 o'clock, uh, gathering by 9.30, and starting, uh, march starts at 10. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas, and with me here today is Andre Perez, who made two trips to Standing Rock, North Dakota, and participated in the nonviolent direct action trainings. And just the whole experience there of, of people really taking up their, owning their kuiana and doing what needs to be done to protect it. Mm -hmm. So Andre, the, um, you, um, in your, your pictures of, of how people manage to live in this rather hostile envi <laughs> environment, it was incredibly creative and beautiful. And, and, and keeping that message out, out in front, right. like, like the one with um, Leonard um, Peltier, who mm -hmm. we, we thought might be headed toward a different life this week, but uh, not to be. 
many people were hoping and praying that Obama would grant clemency or some kind of commutation to Leonard Peltier's um, life sentence, and unfortunately, that didn't happen. And so, you know, um, people held out hope, but you know, the struggle continues. The struggle continues, and that's the main thing. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> in your um, in the uh, time there, people made made it work. You know. People use what get. Work. Yeah, kind of use good. what get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, mahalo kame aloa. You know, ai kame aloa. Um, you know, thankful for what we have. We'll eat what's there, what's available. Um, and it was just a collective um, sharing, caring, looking out for one another. And even even on the level of the medicine, you had some pictures of the the, the medics tent and um, making medicines there and. Yeah, that, that was an, uh, a very powerful component. And, I, you know, I want to point out that we had one of our um, Hawaiian activist doctors, Dr. Kalama Niheo, who was involved in helping to organize that. She's a member of the um, Standing Rock Medic and Healers Council. So, and so it's important, to, I think, to acknowledge that Hawaii had some pretty good ties to this struggle. Um, but they had um, a medic and healers camp. And in that camp, you had a, a yurt that had a regular MD doctor. Then you had another yurt that had the naturopathic, um, homeopathic medicines. And you'll see here in the pictures that they were well outfitted. You had people making tinctures and tonics and teas. You know, if you chose to go to the herbal tent, you know, you'd tell them what your ailment was and then whip you up something, you know, whether it was a tonic or a tincture or a tea mm. or whatever. Um, there was a... Um, a mental health and um, emotional kind of trauma tent for people who are experiencing, you know, trauma because of the stress of, you know, the violence that the police were bringing on the protectors. There was a place to go to talk to people about that. There was a, a Lomi um, and a chiropractic tent that was set up as well. So the overall health care at Standing Rock, I think, might be better than what you'd find on the street <laughs> in any given city or town, you know. <laughs> It sounds like it, to, especially the, the part of you the, where you can just go in and they'll whip you up a, a tincture for what ails you and have it to be really for you. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. That's a vision to hold. Right. You know, I, I walked in at like yeah, 10 o'clock at night and said, you know, I'm, I'm coughing and I got, you know, um, congestion. Hold on. And five minutes later, you know, this brewing tea that was really um, custom made for me and what I was feeling, you know. And then they gave me a bottle of this um, um, tonic, I guess, you know, apple cider. They call fire water with with olena and onions and garlic and chili pepper and stuff, you know. And I would take that lasted me a week. So yeah, it was really, um, you know, organized um, it, within the larger disorganization. There's a lot of organization, <laughs> if that makes sense. You use the word um, decentralized, yeah. and it sounds like that is is the key um, right. to that. You know, we don't have to have this really heavy, top-down, rigid kind of a thing that we can trust within our own groups that will be taking care of our respective kuleana yeah. and that will work together. We're taking care of each other, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you needed firewood, people would share firewood with you. You know, if you if you needed a tarp because your tent ripped, somebody would, you know. Um, and there was a central place to make announcements that, hey, this camp um, on the south side needs firewood or this camp needs help um, erecting a larger tent. So there was sort of this centralized communication over a, a PA system as well. So how did people power up their cell phones? So there was, um, the, there was a central trailer solar panel charging station that was bought in. And then many of the little camps had their own um, solar power, a lot of solar power there. Mm -hmm. My camp, for example, had a trailer that had solar panels on it and, uh, you know, battery packs. And it, it ran our whole camp. It ran power for all of the yurts, lights, and for our kitchen allowed us to charge our equipment, cameras, you know, batteries, And whatever. that was enough, even though... That was enough. Yeah, wow. it was enough. Wow. Um, and then we burned wood in our wood-burning stoves for um, heating and for heating up water and cooking, etc. Well, speaking of heating up water and cooking and camping, you're doing a project here uh, back at home mm -hmm. um, that is really interesting. Can you talk a, 
a little bit about that? Sure. Um, yeah, Hana Kehal um, Learning Farm is our a little family-driven um, stewardship that piece of aina, piece of land that we are, have been fortunate. Um, Kamehameha Schools, Bishop Estate in uh, Waiava, Pearl City side, on the shores of Pu'uloa, um, have given us um, the the privilege, I would say, of being being stewards of this little four-acre parcel of land, and because of Partially because of my background in environmental restoration on Kaho Olave, um, you know, they saw that you know, I had some experience in doing land restoration. So we were given stewardship and we're you know, reconverting this aina back to a sort of a you know, kanaka state, um, replanting native plants, doing weed control. But we're creating a kipuka of um, consciousness and resistance and empowerment for, for our Hawaiian community. So we, we're opening lo'i, and in the process of opening lo'i, we're you know, moving towards food security, but we're learning about um, planting and farming and growing. But we also don't just want to grow plants and food. We want to grow people. We want to grow consciousness. Uh, we want to use the place. We use the place for cultural practices. So I do workshops from emu workshops to implement making kapa. I, I have a wahine oh. kapa group that I... I teach them um, and share with them about making their implements. My Wahine Camille is part of the group. Um, we're having Olelo Hawaii classes starting next month, every Sunday for community free. Wow. And we'll learn Hawaiian language around activities that oh. we do on the land. We're opening Lo'i. Um, That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And it's a labor of love, but it's an investment in the community. And it's an investment in our future and our children and our culture and our lahui and, so and already i saw uh, you you're having sort of international visitors um the the group from brown oh. um yeah so i had a student group from brown university we were constantly hosting uh student groups in this exchange of labor and service learning and we share and teach uh about the restoration about the as a student the importance of research to land restoration for Hawaii. Of course, we have the Kuleana, um, the Kuleana LCAs that we can research and learn about what was what the people were doing land there. Land commission awards. Land commission awards, and the native and foreign testimonies tell us in the 1850s what they were doing on the land, what they were growing, what they were farming. So that research wow. informs our restoration. That's beautiful. You're getting really deep into the, the old title and all right, that. Right, wow. right. And it's important so that we know what our kupuna, what our ancestors were doing on the land, and that informs us to what we should be doing, what we should be growing, and what's sort of culturally contextualized. So um, if somebody was interested in, in this sort of uh, work, wh how, how do they find out more about um, it? We have... Um, hanakehau at gmail.com and email. We have a hanakehau.com website and we're on Facebook, Hanakehau Learning Farm on Facebook. And we're small. We don't have any big grants or nonprofit funding. It's really family, community driven and it's just um, this grassroots effort. For example, yesterday I, I have a, we were at the farm hooking up um, some electrical so we can have lights. And there was a classmate, a guy I went to high school with, who just came out to Kokua, you know. And it's through, it's Kokua driven, really. Um, and, you know, a lot of students come. Of course, Hawaiian students got to work off their scholarship hours, too. So, you know, we make it service learning, you know, and this exchange of we're sharing what EK we have, and they're coming out and helping us with manpower. So do you think? Wahine power. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, that that was a really interesting thing in that in that list of, of principles. I think it was pretty clear the top there was something on the you were teaching about the patriarchy, and I thought, wow, now here's an enlightened group. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's something that I'm moving into and learning about myself. You know, um, uh, the uh, the understanding of patriarchy and male dominance at Standing Rock was, to me, paramount. So like the, in, in their upper levels of leadership meetings with the he headsmen of the different tribes and uh, the, the elders and council people, I, what I witnessed and saw was the women there were educating 
the men on how patriarchy affects all of us and how sexism and chauvinism um, is paramount and that men usually make decisions, men have leadership roles. And so they were starting to decolonize that, you know, and deconstruct that. And I think it's important and it's something that we all come from. I come from a background of patriarchy and chauvinism and it's unconscious. But we need to become conscious and learn about how it alters um, our interactions with each other and how it continues, you know, oppression and how it understanding and learning this liberates all of us, you know, and, and makes us stronger and more cohesive as a Lahui. So um, we don't get a lot of talk about patriarchy and oppression um, in terms of male-female interactions here in Hawaii, but, you know, I'm starting to learn about it. And I can't say that I know everything about it, but I know that I'm conscious of it, and, you know, that's the hey, start. That's a, it's a huge start. Right, and you begin to share about, you know, sharing power is what it boils down to. And actually, our ancestors were, were pretty good about that, um, you know. Like we had Kuhina Nui, and even if there were, there were uh, roles that were... Gendered. Gendered. There, there wasn't a sense of, of, of higher than or... I think, I think we could look back at our ancestors and understand, I think see that they understood the importance of maybe not gender equality, but gender value and gender kuleana, and that everybody makes a contribution. Men might do the, the, the imu, but wahine did the kapa that made the malo that men wore. Um, so, you know, I, and, and I, I like to sort of move into a, a better understanding of not just gender equality, but gender value, and how in, in cultural contexts we bring, all collectively, we bring the value to our, our lahui and to our community. Thank you, Andre. That is a beautiful place to end um, our talk here on January 20th, 20th. 2017. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha. Mahalo.